Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Anybody go to that party last night? Nobody? <laughs> Did you? Did you? Who went? Who went? Let me see a show of hands. Nice. Woo, okay, amazing. Right. Who stayed in their hotel room and rehearsed their presentation? That was a mistake. <laughs> that was a mistake. Um, which, will be even more, which will be even more of a disappointment when you hear me. Um, so this gentleman up, sitting up here is, uh, is um, Mr. Mark Sheldon from Quack Enterprises, and uh, he's our guy behind the party. He's our, he's our wizard. So well, let's give Mark a big hand for an awesome event last night. And then I'm going to ask you to hold your applause to the end for the other things, and we will have a Q&A at the end. So um, if you just want to hold off on that, we're going to go ahead and get started. You're here to hear about events and how to craft the unforgettable event. And here I have the people that do such things for a living. Um, my name is Jean Colombinet. I work for Hewlett Packard. I'm the me Messaging and Outreach Program Manager. Um, and I do some 40 plus events a year. And then sitting over here is uh, Gary. What are you doing here? Uh, thanks, Jean. Uh, my name is Gary Kevorkian. I'm a Marketing Communications Manager at Cisco, part of the events team there. Uh, probably done two to three hundred events over the course of my career, so I know what this is all about. Uh, became part of the OpenStack community about two years ago when I joined MetaCloud, handled all their summit presences and a lot of other events for them prior to the Cisco acquisition back in September of last year. And I also manage the OpenStack LA meetup group. Thank you, Gary. Liz. Hey there, Liz Tucci. I work at Cisco. I'm a PM and engagement manager, so I actually don't do this for a living, so don't be afraid if you don't. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I work in the engineering group at Cisco, uh, running OpenStack. Thank you. Angela, tell us all about you. Hi, I'm Angela. I'm the senior director of events at the Linux Foundation, where I've been for coming on eight years. Um, to date, or now, we produce about 75 events or event activations a year for um, the Linux Foundation, our own events, um, community groups, um, developer groups like Linux Plumbers Conference, um, as well as all of our collaborative projects like Open Daylight, OPNFV, Cloud Foundry, and then miscellaneous other uh, open source companies. Thank you very much. And this is Sharon here. Tell us a little bit about you. Hi, Sharon Cordes. I'm the Strategic Accounts Manager for O'Reilly Media. So a company that is really well known for crafting amazing events. Uh, we have our Strata brand, our Velocity brand, and our big open source convention, OSCON, which is my baby. Um, we, as part of my job, I work with sponsors to organize really amazing developer events. But before O'Reilly, I worked for Macworld Magazine, and I organized corporate events for them everything from small private executive summits to massive employee parties with high six-figure budgets. So my experience runs the gamut. Thank you, Sharon. So we had made some promises about talking about uh, selecting venues, balancing your budget, even if you don't have one, exceeding expectations for the attendees, um, understanding the community and how to reflect that into your events, and then some best practices using some processes. So we're going to jump right into it. Um, like we already talked about the panel. There's all our logos and where we come from. So first up is we're going to talk about balancing a budget, even if that budget is zero. And one of the best people on this panel to be able to talk about that is Gary. Oh, thanks, Gene. Um, yeah, I'd like to start off the budget portion of our panel talking about a type of event that I think is at the very core of what OpenStack is all about, and that's the user groups and the meetups. I'd like to share some tips that I've learned over the course of the last year managing OpenStack LA and how you guys can make great events happen without spending a fortune or even a penny. One of the things that always surprises people <coughs> when I talk about my meetup is that my, my budget is always zero. So how do I do a monthly meetup with great presenters, food and drinks, raffles, prizes, giveaways, and never charge my members a penny? I beg but in a stately, dignified kind of way. I use the opportunity for companies to come in, present to my group as a way to leverage the funds to make the events happen. Every company that's come in and sponsored my meetup 
has offered to pick up the tab for all the costs related to that particular event. In the last four months, I've had Red Hat, Tesora, HP, and Cisco all come in, provide great presenters, and also pick up all the expenses for, the, for that particular meetup. Um, HP even went the extra mile to send a uh, laptop for a giveaway for our March meetup as a raff, for a raffle prize, so that was great. Um, one of the other things uh, that is also a barrier for a lot of new meetup groups is finding a place to meet. Don't let that be a barrier, just start meeting. A lot of great meetup groups have started in places like coffee houses, bars, restaurants, other public spaces. Just get the ball rolling. As your membership grows, you'll achieve some critical mass and you'll be able to reach out to venues to find a place to host your event. And when you get to the point where you're ready to start rolling in sponsorships, you can make the sponsors of your event also cover the cost of the venues when you get to that point. There are a few great resources available, especially through the OpenStack Foundation for OpenStack events. Uh, brand new, I think it just launched within the last couple of months, is a new user group portal that's up on the Foundation website. Get your group registered there. And you can also list all of your groups on the OpenStack Foundation events page for free. All these resources are available and it doesn't cost you a penny. The other great thing that I love about running the meetup is using a resource like meetup.com. The great thing for me there is I can look and look at my members and see all the other groups that they belong to. So what I can do is reach out to the organizers of those other meetups, we can leverage our resources and make the events even greater by maximizing all the resources by combining them together, co-mingling the groups, have combined meetups, and uh, really make our events great. So. With that being said, I'd now like to toss the ball over to the entire group. We're going to have a little discussion on some best practices for managing an event when you actually do have a budget. So we look for um, shooting for the moon during our investigation phase. So we'll go out there and we'll select a whole bunch of different varieties of things that we can do. Um, and then be able to pick and choose from the ones that we have and narrow it down to things that are the most economical doable as well as something that we can afford. Um, but usually I'll go in with a really open mind, very flexible, and then get the big picture. Um, I would also say start early, um, especially right now. Venues are not hurting for business. So for larger events where you, know, you need a hotel or a convention center or anything like that, be flexible, be willing to you know, look at different locations, not just say San Francisco, for example. Um, the more flexible you are and the more time that you give yourself to find something, the more negotiating room you have, and you know, you'll be able to find something at the best rate. Right, and then I have tin cupping, which is also known as other people's money. So there may be, if you're working with a sponsor, there may be more than one group within the sponsoring company that wants to have access to your audience. So if you can have a good conversation with your sponsor, you can ask them, you know, are there other groups that might want to join you and would you want to pass the hat? Because that's the way that you can maximize your event budget and really get, you know, the most money that you can for planning your event. But you need to be careful and make sure that you understand the expectations of each group because you want to make sure to be able to have help them meet their goals for sponsoring the event. And you don't want there to be any confusion about who gets what deliverable. Yeah, and then also just do regular budget reviews. Um, things can get out of hand quickly. So you want to make sure you're you know consistently and constantly looking at your budget, making sure you're not going over in certain areas. And last but not least, travel and entertainment and understanding your responsibility as the budget owner for the show. Um, and that actually is really what the main bullet should be here, is really understand what your budget needs to cover. I've been in a few situations where I've been given a budget for a show where I find out three weeks into the process, oh, by the way, you have to house and fly the team to the event, and you go back to square one because all your plans have to change because you really didn't understand what your budget has to cover. Don't underestimate T&E expenses. There are always going to be changes, extra charges, and, as, and like with any travel plans, book early to save as much money as you can. Something that uh, when you're getting venue or vendor um, 
uh, estimates, they tend to not tell you about the tax and service charge, which varied on where you are can add 30 to 40 percent. So definitely make sure that you're looking not only at the cost they give you, but then the the service charge or VAT if you're going out of the country, um, as well as the tax. Um, so you actually are looking at the full amount. So she brings up a good point because selecting a venue and vendors is our next subject. So thank you for that lead in. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I'm trying to select a venue or a vendor is I'll go on a site visit. And when I do these site visits, I'll use a, a DMC or a destination management company. These guys are locals for the region. So any place I go, I come to Vancouver, I call the DMC, they drive me around, we look at all the vendors, we look at venues, we, we do tastings. Um, they, they know, intimately know the region. So especially with for OpenStack Summit, we have the opportunity every six months to be able to change our location. So having that location add a unique value to your event is something that you can do. And these DMCs are fantastic for that. I'd highly suggest you use them if you aren't. The other thing I can use, you know, if I don't have a big budget, is pick up some tourist travel books. You know, um, understand the area and the region that you're in. The more you know and the more investigation and planning that you do, you're going to be able to um, open up and be more flexible to your selections. Um, so we always look for a unique factor associated with that particular location. We want to we want to wow our people. We want to give them some amazing experiences, and location is a very good way to play with that. The other thing is, as uh, is, uh, Angela is mentioning on, is, is hidden fees. Uh, these these will kill you. A absolutely, just just bury your budget. Um, so you come in and you'll find a venue. It, it looks great. Um, you think this is the one for you. And then you find out that they have an exclusive vendor lock-in, which means that you can't use anybody else besides their selection. Now, their selection might be some guy that brings hot dogs, and that's it, you know. And you're like, what? Or, or, or pizza, or, you know, or they only have a certain uh, type of beverage that they can bring into the, into the venue. So those things uh, we try to really look out for. A lot of times if I come into a venue, even if I think it's the best one, I won't select it if I have a vendor locked in. Um, they'll do material handling and storaging, I mean furnishing, linings. Uh, they, they'll say, oh, these uplighting, this will look really good in the room. And if you say, yes, it would, well, all of a sudden, guess what you're paying for? Thousands of dollars in uplighting. And you're like, wait a second, I didn't expect that. Um, power, AV, networking, when you're setting up these events, especially the meetups, a lot of places will double charge you for this. Security in the door, uh, there's labor unions. If you're doing your event on Sunday or Saturday, that's overtime. And they will charge you for it, every single cent. So a lot of times, too, you can come into a venue and find unique things about it. Um, but sometimes you want a blatant canvas. You want to be able to walk in and create a, a blank canvas from, from what's already there. So selecting a hotel. Or, or you know, a nice open area like even this room. You can do something amazing with this, with some creativity and a little bit of focus. So I've got a lot of good known relationships that I've got, um, and I keep them. I mean, they are like gold to me because in this industry, a lot of people are moving around and bumping around to different uh, different job positions. So if I've got a vendor I have worked with before and they are good, I will stick with them. And, and I will treat them right because they are, they're, they're your goal. They're the people that you can rely on to do it so that you don't have to do absolutely everything yourself. Um, transportation requirements. I mean, if you've got a venue that's like, you know, two miles away, you're going to have to transport people there. I mean, bus nightmare, 14 buses in Paris on the streets, uh, closing down streets, getting the police involved. This can all get very complicated. So very, consider those when you have to transport people. Um, I already talked about contact shifting. Um, so a little story that I have. Uh, when we go out and we do these site visits um, in Paris, they took me to um, all these different places. So we, I looked at the itinerary, and we're going to see a bunch of venues. Going to do some tastings I see on there. So about the second venue I get to, they bring out what's the, called small plates. Oh, it was wonderful. You know, they bring out all this food. Some of it's kind of weird. You know, some of it tastes kind of funny. Some of it's really good. They dowel it up for you, make it look all special. And so we do one of those, and we go see another, another venue. And I'm like, OK. And they bring us more small plates. 
And they bring us up to this little small room up in the top of this mansion area that we're looking at, overlooking this beautiful, um, this beautiful garden. But more small plates come, but they don't stop. I mean, just <laughs> plates are coming, and uh, I mean, <laughs> didn't we just eat? <laughs> and so I look back at my schedule. We have two more of these scheduled for the rest of the day. And we get to the third one, and fantastic food. They bring out a carver, and they've got all these different smoothies, and it's, it's Paris, so they're serving us champagne all the time. And I'm sitting there going, okay, I don't know if I can do this again. <laughs> and sometimes the food was just a little bit different than you'd ever want it to be. Um, <clears throat> and then we get to the fourth one. I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in the car, and I'm looking at, at the staff that I've got coming with me, and I say, you know, I'm hungry. Are you guys hungry? Because I'm starving. We really need to get some more food with us. And they're like, no, I can't eat more food. I go, come on. Suck it up, we're gonna do this, you know. We get in there, we go to the fourth one, and sure enough, lots more small plates, lots more champagne. But uh, so I just wanna let you know that when we go out and do these things, we're really taking the bullet for you, you know. <laughs> it, it can be pretty tough. It's a tough life. So another thing we wanna talk about is exceeding attendee expectations, and, uh, and one of my favorite people for doing that, she always blows me away, is Sharon. <laughs> Yeah, always good to rem remember that food is a religion in France. <laughs> <laughs> so every planner wants their party to be memorable and amazing. Um, the number one rule for exceeding expectations is really to understand your audience. So who are they? Are they developers? Are they technology professionals? Or are they business people? Business people are going to be looking for great food and beverage and a really nice venue for networking. Developers, on the other hand, of course they want good food and beverage, but they really are more engaged with um, activities like games and then having cool music playing in the background. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've had a sponsored poker party at our big open source convention in Portland, and it's been a very popular event. It, it really is rather satisfying to see hundreds of geeks sitting around counting cards. <laughs> Also, know what's been done before. Anybody can throw a beer bash, but what about hosting a beer tasting event maybe with a local craft brewing team who can actually talk about how the beer is made? That would really impress people. Uh, one word of caution to remember is uh, beware of loud music. Nobody has a good time when they have to scream to be heard, so make sure that a DJ or a band that's hired to play at your event understands that people are gonna be chatting in the background and to keep the music at a dull roar. By the way, don't advertise everything that you have planned. Aim to surprise and delight. O'Reilly usually focuses our events around a theme. So we'll have, we'll come up with some creative theme and then we'll have activities, food and beverage that match with that theme. We often hire celebrity or character impersonators who will circulate with the audience, like our alien friend there, and engage them in conversation or uh, be around for a photo shoot. This is always really popular. I once hired a female Elvis impersonator for a Las Vegas themed style event, and no one will ever forget Elvis herself. <laughs> Um, next, make sure that you put thought into what, your, what advantage you might be able to get out of your venue or the city where you will be holding your event. Play it up. Like, uh, I remember when Angela and the LinuxCon folks held an event in uh, New Orleans, they actually got the attendees all geared up in Mardi Gras style dress and they hosted a parade in the city, which was really fun. Also, do you have a luminary who might be attending your event that would participate in the activities and get the ball rolling? Yes, that is actually Tim O'Reilly there going down in the dunk tank with his underwear on. And <laughs> by the way, our president was standing on the sidelines holding his clothes in a paper bag, yes. <laughs> oh, and there's Elvis or Selvis too. Another idea that I've seen work really well is to host a pub crawl in a really cool area of the city where your event is taking place so that the attendees can get a feel for the area nightlife. 
And this is always really great for sponsors too because they can kind of take over one of the clubs and make it like a private party even though it's just really a stop on the tour. Can you give your attendees access to something that they wouldn't normally be able to get otherwise? Can you take them a little bit out of their comfort zone? Are there any tourist attractions where you can host a private event? We once held a party for a bunch of publishing people at the New York City Library, and that was really cool. Okay, let's go back to food and beverage. So the core of your event is the food and beverage, and you wanna make sure that you make it as excellent as your budget will allow. It's great to match your food and beverage with a theme and make your party even more memorable. We recently hosted an event that was themed around three cities where we were going to be expanding the event, San Francisco, London, and Singapore. And each area in the party had city-themed activities, food and beverage, and decor. So it was kind of like really cool to go to the different areas and each area was sponsored too. So that was a great sponsorship opportunity. Finally, use your imagination to really come up with a wow factor that will keep your attendees talking and make them want to come to next year's event. I uh, was at a party where we had developers dressed up in padded sumo costumes and trying to knock each other down. That was really fun. Something simple that can work really well is a themed photo booth with props that the attendees can use. Uh, to dress up and take photos with their friends. And that also allows for a really great takeaway because they can take the photos home and remember how great your event was. The tricky part is when you're hosting an annual event to try to one-up yourself year over year. In this case, multiple heads are better than one. So you want to get a team together to throw around <coughs> theme ideas and um, activity ideas and then you know come up with something that is really going to work but always keep your audience top of mind what do they like what are they interested in but don't take yourself too seriously remember this is just a party thank you Sharon so if you want to amaze and delight your people um, you really need to understand the community and the community events uh, culture, and we have uh, Liz here to be talking about that today. Thank you. Um, so just first up, you, um, you have to attend and participate. Um, so go ahead and uh, go to other events. Um, it's the best way to kind of understand what the community is doing, whether it's a meetup or a party or, you know, a more formal thing. Um, it'll help you stay connected and kind of get a pulse on what's going on within the community. Definitely contribute. I know this, you kind of wouldn't expect in this session that we'd be promoting um, being a contributor to the OpenStack community, but you know, you'll know you understand the process. You need those plus ones and plus twos. And so you'll, you know, during the contribution process, you'll meet people, you know, not necessarily from your own company. And if you're going to plan an event later, they could be stakeholders that you can call on and bounce ideas off of. Um, so. So own it. Um, you know, anyone can plan an event. So there's, on, on this panel, there are some event planners who do that as their day job. You know, I'm, I'm a PM, and I planned an internal event. You know, engineers, uh, we have one on our team who planned Pi Tennessee. So, you know, anybody can really do it. But if you're going to plan an event, you know, it's your responsibility for a couple of things. You know, you need to ensure it's a success. Um, but also make sure you promote um, appropriate conduct and kindness to other people. Um, and, and diversity is a good thing too, you know. Um, by attending this event, we all agreed to follow the OpenStack Foundation's code of conduct. And I think this community is pretty unique in that if anyone was behaving badly, I think we'd all kind of police ourselves and someone would call someone out on it. Um, but just, yeah, so, so own it. Um, I can tell you one thing not to do. Um, I went to an event, a sponsored event, and I had done the right thing. I had, I had gotten my ticket in advance. Um, I, I, re I read and reread the email of where to be and when. You know, we took the bus there. Um, and then once we were in line, um, we noticed this group being led by us into the venue. And so we all kind of went, uh, hello, you know, what's going on? Um, and then as kind of we, our group got to the front, we were then told, oh, no, that's it. Not letting anybody else in. So you had this like 
angry group outside um, upset. So I, I went and tried to talk to someone and there was nobody from the sponsoring company at the door to talk to, just their event company was there. So it just left a really bad taste in everybody's mouth. So, so you know, if you're going to plan an event, you know, just kind of be present, make sure it's, it, it goes smoothly. Um, you know, another thing you can do, so, so you don't necessarily have to plan a big party or big meetup. You know, you can kind of just dive in and start small. So if you're, if you're sitting here wondering if there's an event you can plan, it can be as simple as booking a conference room, gathering a couple people from even your own company, and just talking about OpenStack and seeing, you know, what people are working on and what the pressing issues are. Um, within Cisco, the company I work for, we saw the need to bring people working on OpenStack um, from kind of across our company together to share and learn. Um, we had a two-day event that was full of lightning talks, technical talks, panel discussions. We had execs come in and speak. We thought maybe we'd get 100, 200 people if we were lucky. And we actually had over 400 people just from Cisco attend in person and online. Um, we had a waiting list. It was, it was pretty impressive. It, it's kind of a testament to how this community is growing and there's a need to bring people together um, for these events. So, um, you know, a couple, a couple final thoughts on this topic. Um, beware of the loud person. So there's always gonna be that loud person giving you feedback. They might not represent the entire group, so you know, ask around and, and go back to those people you've met during, during other events or during the contribution process and bounce ideas off of them. Um, uh, don't heavily overbrand your stuff. Um, if you're sponsoring an event, if you're a company sponsoring an event, that's great, you know, put your name on it, but, but you don't have to kind of shove it down people's throat. I think everybody knows who works for who and who's sponsoring an event. Um, you know, this, this community is definitely, uh, you know, it's, we're different. We can have people at two different competitors working together on a project, and that doesn't always happen um, elsewhere. You know, we're all friends. Um, and then just, you know, finally, the, the local experience, which we've all kind of mentioned. Um, the, you know, we don't get outside these conference centers all that much, and so sometimes these events are a great way to not only network, but actually see a new a new site in a, a, a country or a state you haven't been to. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much, Liz. So when we talk about all of the different things that we've we've been discussing, it, it takes process to put this together, and uh, Angela is going to talk a little bit about that. Disorderly order, yes. Um, so we've broken this up into four stages, and I'm going to try to not be verbose on this and kind of get through everything quickly and focus on best practices. Um, on the initiation, so you you know you've gone out and you've found your your venue, um, you've got your date, you're moving forward. Um, the couple things you need to do here. One, this is the time for the brainstorming. So we will typically, you know, again, get everyone together and do the crazy brainstorm. Anything goes. Um, you can work on fine tuning from there, but, you know, start and have fun with it. Um, and, you know, the more people you have involved, the more creative you can get. Um, you really need to nail down your event basics, the things that you have to have, of course, your venue, but Jean mentioned earlier, you know, Wi-Fi, you know, what kind of audio visual do you need? Um, food and beverage, what are you gonna be serving? Um, you know, registration, your website, your email communications, I mean, how are you getting attendees and all those types of things. We keep track of everything uh, through two different, well, two different things, uh, Google Docs. We have very, very, uh, all, many tabs on spreadsheets on Google Docs. And then we also use Basecamp, which is, I would recommend it, it's a very easy project management software, um, lots of to-do, you can put to-dos, assign tasks to people and everything. Um, when you get into your planning phase, so keep everyone on track, get a group together, you know, and assign the tasks and make everyone, um, you know, have everyone assigned to things so you're not kind of handling everything yourself. Be flexible. Um, so we've talked about budgets. I can tell you for us, we basically start with a low and a high, and we know that those things are gonna change around as we go. Um, so you really wanna be flexible. Um, as you get closer to an event, AV could come in much higher than you thought. You wanna know already where you're gonna be able to cut back um, if that happens. Backup plans, this is a big one. So we're gonna start with outdoor venues. Um, always have an indoor. Uh, option, even though you might not like it as much, you really, really need to have that. 
Um, emergency type things. You know, you should always kind of have that plan in place. You don't want to be on site and then something happens and then, you know, you're the one everyone's looking at to kind of guide what happens next. Um, the code of conduct, we talked about this really quickly. Everyone, I think, in open source right now has a code of conduct. Great to have. If something actually happens, what are your next steps? Your team should already have this in place. Um, so keep that in mind. On your execution, so you're on site now. Um, I'm going to kind of jump down to number three here on assigning task ownership because I think this goes up to number one. Um, you're the person that everyone's going to be coming to with every little question that day, and you need to put out fires. You need to make those decisions. Assign the task ownership for you know registration and handling speakers and your keynote room and your exhibit and your sponsors. Assign those to other people so that you can focus on kind of the higher level. They'll come to you with the individual questions they have. That allows you to stay cool like Fonzie and uh, actually put out all those fires. I've been doing events for 20 years. Things are going to go wrong. That is sort of the nature of an event. So your job is to keep the attendees from seeing that and to make things smooth on site. Um, with that, we talk about here change. Keep any changes that you do on site small. You know, you might start setting up for an event and think, oh, maybe we should actually do this. Don't. You're just asking, I mean, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Implement that for the future. Um, but while you are assigning tasks to other people and uh, leading into our closure stage, you on site want to be observing the attendee experience and your sponsor's experience and the speaker's experience. You want to talk to those stakeholders too. That is the best way that you are going to get information on what worked and what doesn't to implement for future events. Um, finally, moving on to our closure stage. So you have put so much effort into this event, and it's closed or it's done, and you're exhausted, and you think that you're done, but you're not. A um, few things that need to happen here, of course, the more basics, you know, getting all your vendors paid, compiling all of your data, getting that data to your stakeholders, you know, making sure your budget is all, you know, you you came out under budget, etc. Um, but you also need to get feedback. So as I said, I would try to get that feedback beforehand. Uh, Liz briefly mentioned the loud voice. Unfortunately, with surveys, when you send them out online afterwards, you know, we typically, for a 1,500-person event, will get about 30 people respond. It's not really giving you a good cross-section of the attendee experience. Incentivizing people helps. You can do like a raffle or something like that. Um, it helps a little. That might up it to 150 out of 1,500. But if you can find ways to get feedback on site, that is actually the best chance you have of getting the feedback that's gonna be helpful. Also, doing your deep dive with your team. We actually start this on site. We have a what worked, what doesn't doc, Google doc, that every one of those task owners um, has access to on site. And then while people's brains are fresh after the event, go over it. You're not gonna remember a lot of those things three, a lot of those things three weeks later. So while it's fresh, get everything there. And then I will close up with uh, strike while the iron is hot. So most people that are doing events are going to be go doing another event. If people like your event, that is your time to go ahead and kind of get them hooked for the following year. So whether that's attendees, sponsors, speakers, et cetera, you know, take that information, take what you learn, and then immediately go out and start pushing the next event. You're absolutely right on that one. Um, you really need to walk around and talk to the people and find out what they liked and formulate what's going to happen next time. I mean, I'm walking into my event, just observing. I'm cool. Nobody sees me stressed out. I'm checking out the attendees. Hey, oh, do you have a, a memorable experience tonight? What did you like about that? Um, last night, I asked a lady in the restroom, I'm like, so you, you having a great time? She's like, uh, I'm one of the cooks. <laughs> she looked pretty sweaty. She was really working hard. <laughs> So w when we talk about um, these type of events and everybody walks into them, they see me. I am fully exposed. And it stresses me out to let everybody see inside of me like that. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do to try to minimize the stress. Um, if you look at the statistics on different type of professions that are out there, um, there, are, there are some results that tell us that, um, that event management is one of the top five to top 10 st most stressful professions to do. It's because we throw ourselves out there. It's because we have so many interfaces. There's so many moving parts. Um, and it can be very stressful. So I never think of myself as somebody that goes out into the battlefield or somebody that's flying an airplane or I'm going to open somebody up or fly an airplane. That, that's not how I consider my job to be 
but it does hold that stress factor. Um, you've got budgets, you've got deadlines, you have to have people stick to those deadlines and they don't want to do that. Um, so lots of interfacing associated with that. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, stress and how to deal with that because it, it isn't the easiest thing to do. We do know that people are going to get upset. Um, we, we can foresee this. I mean, like Angela, I've been doing this for a long time. I know that somebody's going to come up to me and just have a meltdown for some reason. And me not overreacting to that is going to be, um, going to be key. Who wants to have a backup plan? Drink heavily. <laughs> no. Water. I'm just kidding. Water. I mean, honestly, being as prepared as you can going into it is is the best thing that you can do. And I think knowing, I think a lot of people put, I mean, this is kind of like a live stage production, right? And, you know, I think that's part of what causes that stress, which, by the way, I think is different than dangerous. I was watching whatever that show is with the guys on the Bering Sea and ladies, and that's, that's dangerous. That's different. But... Um, things are going to go wrong. I mean, I, and I may be saying go wrong is not a good way to do it, but, you know, things change. Uh, this is not something that you can control, you know, completely. So as much as you can prepare beforehand and have those people that are kind of, you've delegated responsibilities to, you know, I tend to run around like this at our events, but, and that's with people, you know, delegated responsibilities. So, you know, just kind of having those plans, being prepared, um, but also just kind of letting things roll off of your shoulders, right? You know, not getting so freaked out if somebody's upset because they are going to be. And then all you do is do the best that you can to handle the situation to make them happy. I was going to add that, you know, it's difficult if you're a perfectionist to be an event planner because events are never perfect. And so you have to be able to deal with situations like Angela said when they come up. I've seen very few problems that can't be fixed. So just keep your cool fix it and you know depend on your team to help you get through the choppy areas because if you can take care of problems when they crop up the attendee will have you know a better experience and it is part of exceeding attendee experience when you're able to deal with stress and and situations that are problems and if, as long as they don't see the problem that is happening, if you can keep it in the background, it will seem like the event is almost seamless. Yeah, and to that point, kind of do a, do a risk mitigation thing. So think about what could go wrong. Think about what will really tick people off. Like, we know how maddening it is if, if we're at an event and wireless doesn't work. Um, or plan for, you know, if you're running speakers, if someone goes really over, if there's someone maybe you can cut that won't be heavily offended. Or if there's, you know, if you've got time, how are you going to fill that time? So just kind of think about what could go wrong and then have a, an action plan in place. And the last thing I'll say as someone who's been, again, doing this for a long time, as the event manager, when you're on site, don't forget to take care of yourself. And you do not underestimate the physical toll that this will take on you over the course of a five or six day event. I wear a Fitbit. Since I arrived Saturday afternoon, just that. between here and the conventions, uh, here in my hotel, 300 feet away, I've logged 70,000 steps and 32 miles walking. So drink water, take care of yourself, as much as I would have loved to have been at the HP party last night, I knew that my best course of action was room service, some rehearsal, and a good night's sleep before getting up here today. So don't underestimate the physical toll that this will take over the course of a long event. Get some rest and take good care of yourself. Yeah, Gary's absolutely right. I mean, you get nervous, you, you don't realize you know, how, far, how hard you're pushing yourself. But really, the reason why we get to be up here is because a lot of the people that attend this event do really, really awesome stuff. And I always tell my people, they're like, thank you for doing all this, you know, and I'm exhausted, whatever. I'm, I'm like, look, I'm going, just keep doing cool stuff and I'll keep throwing cool parties for you. Because I, th I think that this is a really fun job. It seems like it, it is fun. It, it really shows um, your leadership abilities to come in. So I'd highly encourage you, although you see that it's stressful and you can hear, and it's kind of a little bit scary to throw yourself out there, I would encourage it anyways, because when you do, people will actually see you and come to you and rely on you. You're perceived as a leader. And nobody wants to go out there and throw a, throw a big event. Nobody wants to you know, pull together a meetup. They want somebody else to do it. But if you step up to the plate and you do it yourself, and I highly encourage you to, then people will go, wow, this person's my go-to person. 
and all of a sudden you build out your community. So the last thing we want to do is open it up for a couple Q&A. If anybody's got any questions, uh, I'd like to open up the mic. And you all know how to do events and balance your budget now. Yes, Susanna. <coughs> you can just tell me a question. I'll repeat it. Okay, we can clap now for everybody. So setting expectations. When people come to your party, they're like, is it gonna be as cool as Paris? Well, is it? You know, you're like, gonna, it's gonna be different. Salmon cruelty right there. Okay, we're good. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. See you in Tokyo.